Russia is fighting the war in Ukraine with its fingers, not with its fists. What we're seeing on the ground is concocted and it's fiction that uh, is intended to deceive us. But if Russia wanted to defeat the NATO alliance, it could do a nuclear EMP attack on NATO and the resulting EMP field would black out electric grids from Ireland all the way to the edge of Ukraine. NATO would in effect be paralyzed by that one blow. Would the United States put itself at risk to save NATO Europe? Do the Russians really believe that we would do that? The Russians know that you can certainly win a nuclear war, and I think they're calling our bluff right now. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today on the channel, we have a very special guest, Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. He is Executive Director of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security, served as Chief of Staff of the Congressional EMP Commission. I've spoken about him and his work on this channel many times before, I worked for the CIA and a variety of other places, I'm sure, as a couple PhDs. And uh, he's going to talk all about nuclear vulnerabilities on the NATO side of things, how a nuclear exchange between NATO and Russia might play out, maybe give some insights, uh, whatever he can, on the current situation that's going on. And uh, while we have people here, I know some people have a short attention span. So I think it's very important that you guys stick around for this talk because Dr. Pry is going to talk about a, a fundamental belief that we as Westerners have, which is basically that uh, our perception of nuclear weapons is one of a nuclear deterrence. And most of us have been indoctrinated into the belief that uh, a nuclear war is not only unwinnable, but uh, unthinkable, okay? And that's because of something called mutually assured destruction, the idea that if we did start lobbing nukes back and forth, we, of course, would destroy ourselves. Now, Dr. Fry is going to challenge you on that in the sense that in the East, they don't possess this fundamental belief. They, in fact, view things uh, quite differently. It's almost as cut and dry as we drive on the right side of the road, they drive on the left side of the road. In the East, they actually believe they can win a nuclear war, and they base their whole military strategy around that. So without further ado, I'm just going to let uh, Dr. Pry talk all about all about that and everything else. So let us know uh, what you think about this, Dr. Pry. Sure. Well, the idea that a nuclear war is unwinnable is deeply embedded in our in our strategic culture and in the values of Judeo-Christian civilization, uh, which believe in just war theory, uh, not limiting collateral damage uh, uh, you know, to civilian populations. Uh, and because free societies that are based on democracies or republics, the most valuable thing in them, at least theoretically, is supposed to be the people. And so weapons of mass destruction that threaten the people, uh, uh, it's almost inconceivable for such societies that pace, place the highest value on, on human life as, uh, uh, as the idea that a nuclear war or use of weapons of mass destruction type war would be winnable because you're destroying the thing that is most valued to you. But the strategic cultures of authoritarian and totalitarian states that don't place their highest value on the lives of the people, but place their highest values on, for example, in ideology uh, or place their, and, and on the elites that run that society and who are the ideological spearheads of that society, whether it's a belief in the great Russian nationalism or a belief in communism uh, or a belief in the uh, semi-divine status of Kim Jong-un of North Korea or, or, or a belief in, uh, in radical Islam, uh, if that is your highest value and people are just a means to that end, then you can conceive of victory in a circumstance where you've lost millions of lives in a conflict uh, if you achieve your political, geostrategic, ideological goals. Uh, you can see this, for example, in the Soviet victory in World War II, where they lost 30 million lives, not casualties, but 30 million dead. In fact, conquering the very area that they have invaded today in Ukraine, they're called the bloodlands the area from Ukraine uh, into Eastern Europe of the bloodlands where 30 million Soviet soldiers died. And that's considered a great victory, even though it cost them 30 million lives. Uh, in the West, we have never made such sacrifice, uh, lost such a large proportion of our population. America's, uh, the United States loss in World War II was a few hundred thousand people, not nothing like 30 million people. 
and we probably wouldn't have considered it a victory if we had to pay such an awful, uh, such an awful cost. Now, this, uh, uh, we have very different strategic cultures. You have to rem remember that, particularly here in North America, I think for Canadians and for uh, in the United States both, we've had a long history where we've been isolated from the wars of Europe and Asia by the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The only really big war that we've had here uh, in the United States was the American Civil War, the bloodiest war we've ever fought, 750,000 people uh, lost in that, in, in that war. But for the most part, we've had a very good life here in North America. You know, our focus has been on economic prosperity, living the good life. Uh, uh, we've gotten involved in wars overseas when we think we've had to, but we've never experienced uh, the kind of mass destruction on our own territories that a country like Russia has, for example, that has a very different strategic culture than ours, that going back before modern times, you know, going back to the times of the Mongols and before that have, have been uh, exposed to numerous ex uh, invasions by other countries, have had mass destruction of their civilian population. Uh, you know, uh, those that we know of, you know, beginning around 1000 AD or so, invasions by the Mongols, invasions by the Swedish Empire, uh, you know, invasions by uh, Germany before it was a, a pre, in pre-modern times. Uh, you know, there were Christian crusades launched out of Germany against uh, against uh, part of Russia, uh, invaded by Napoleon, invaded by Germany again in World War One, and then by Hitler. So their strategic culture is one uh, where the expectation of what I, I would call uh, a paranoid strategic culture, it's paranoid from our perspective, but from their perspective, given their history, uh, it's not paranoid to think, wow, we're going to get invaded. Uh, you know, that happens very frequently. And they've got to be prepared for, for a, a massive war that's going to be fought on their territory and a war, a total war, that's aimed at the destruction of their people. That's a, that's a, a belief that's ingrained in Russian strategic culture in a way that it isn't ingrained in ours. We're, we're much more used to peace and to limited wars of limited objectives where we're not out to wage genocidal wars against our, our adversaries. In fact, we'd like to reconstruct them and turn them into democracies if that's, if that's possible when, when, we, when we win a war. And as a consequence of our belief that a nuclear war is unwinnable because it would be such a destructive thing, we have postured our strategic forces. People think that the Russian nuclear posture and our nuclear posture are the same. They're not. They're, they're as different as night and day. Uh, we have, it's true that both sides have intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarines and strategic bombers, but that's about where the similarity ends. Our uh, strategic posture is positioned for transparency and for avoiding nuclear war and det deterring it. So most of our weapons are not on intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, which can be launched in minutes. We've even downloaded uh, our, the warheads off of our ICBM. So every ICBM only carries a single warhead. It, this is a signal to Russia that we don't plan a first strike against them. Because if you were planning a first strike, you'd build up your ICBM force, you'd put multiple warheads on it so that one missile could take out many silos, many targets. But we don't do that. In fact, the ICBM force is the smallest part of our triad. We rely much more heavily on sub-launch ballistic missiles that are not equipped with intercontinental ballistic missiles. They have intermediate range missiles. So our submarines have to put to sea in order to attack Russia. And they can see when our submarines are in port. You know, we don't, we don't keep most of them at sea. Only about a third of them are, at, uh, are out at sea to be survivable. The most of them are at port and our adversaries can see that. So they, they can see we haven't mobilized our forces to launch a, a surprise attack against them. And the bombers, well, the bombers uh, are, we have more warheads on them than we have on the ICBMs too. And it takes three days to mobilize our bomber force. So it's something that they would see us doing. We're not postured to make a surprise attack every day. The Russians are different. You know, they have never forgotten the many surprise attacks that they've suffered, including Operation Barbarossa, which was when Nazi Germany almost conquered the Soviet Union and almost destroyed it in a massive surprise attack. And their general staff says, we're never going to be surprised again. If there's ever another war, we're going to be the ones making the surprise attack. And they have postured their strategic forces to do that exactly. Most of their warheads 
as our intercontinental ballistic missiles that are ready to launch in a few minutes. Uh, the, uh, even their ballistic missile submarines carry intercontinental ballistic missiles, so they don't have to put to sea in order to attack us. They can launch right from port side and, and, and strike us, just like the land-based ICBM force. Even their ballistic missile submarines at sea, unlike us, you know, they don't send their, they usually don't send their submarines into the deep oceanic areas of, of the Pacific and the Atlantic. Uh, they're afraid that we would use our attack submarines to surprise them and attack their ballistic missile submarines. So they protect their submarines from surprise attack by keeping them in bastion areas, this White Sea and the Sea of Out Husk, which are heavily defended by their Navy. Now, underwater, they have cables across the bottom of these seas so that their submarines can clandestinely hook in to the general staff command and control network. So we can't even listen in if they're sending communications, unlocking codes, emergency action messages. They can get all of that secretly by these cables, just like all the other missile forces of Russia. They can raise the mobilization of their forces secretly. We won't see it. And then they could launch their surprise attack. The only part of the, uh, of the Russian strategic forces that's highly visible for us is their bomber force. You know, uh, the bombers, just because of the nature of bombers, they've got to be fueled up. They have to have pilots. You've got to upload the nuclear weapons. That's a very a highly visible thing. But they, they have practiced and have exercised not mobilizing the bomber force so that we would see, oh, the bomber force isn't mobilized. That's a clue that they're not getting ready for a surprise attack. And they would hope, it, hope that we would misinterpret you know, the non-mobilization of bombers uh, so that uh, we would not raise our posture. And in effect, that's exactly where we are today. This so far has sounded like a theoretical discussion. But a couple of Sundays ago on February 27th, dictator of Russia, Vladimir Putin, declared a special combat alert for his strategic nuclear forces. And he went down into one of the hundreds of deep underground command and control shelters. These are huge underground facilities buried under hundreds of meters of solid granite that can accommodate each uh, one of them, can accommodate like 30,000 Russian military and political elites. They're impervious to nuclear attack by us. It's one of the evidences that they believe you can fight and win a nuclear war because their elites at least can survive it but they also have massive civil defense capabilities for their civilian population too. For example, all the, the subways, the huge subway system in Moscow has black nuclear blast doors on it. None of our subways have something like that so that you can get the population of Moscow down into the subways, close the doors, and they would have a, a much better chance of surviving a, a nuclear attack than, than we would if something like that were to happen. But the last thing, any adversary, whether it's the Russians or the United States, is going to attack is the cities anyway, you know, because the object of a, of, a, of a nuclear war, if you want to win it, is to disarm your adversary, to destroy his bombers, his ICBMs, his submarines in port. That's what their first strike plan would be about. And then you can hold the cities hostage and say, surrender now, or we're going to start taking out your cities one by one. That's been the, the Russian plan. They have never uh, agreed with the idea of mutual assured destruction. They have encouraged us to believe in mutual assured destruction so that we will not copy their plan, a war winning plan. They want us to just focus on nuclear deterrence. And let us hope that it is not too late, okay? Because uh, uh, the Biden administration has been unwilling to admit that the Ru Russia has really gone to an increased readiness level with its nuclear forces. Uh, and I think that that is, that's being done for political reasons. They don't want to combine their humiliation in Afghanistan with an even worse humiliation and have to explain to the American people, you know, why has Ukraine policy, what's so important about Ukraine to the West that we are willing to go to the verge of a nuclear war with Russia about it? And I'm not just blaming Biden here. You know, the chicken hawks in the Republican Party are all for jumping into Ukraine and, and, and getting us involved in a war in Ukraine. And that's because they're being encouraged, you know, by all, almost all of our information about what's happening on the ground in Ukraine is coming from the Ukrainian government, which wants us to join in, uh, jump in, jump in and get involved in the war and help the Ukrainians win. And it's also come from, coming from the Biden administration, because the Biden administration doesn't want, President Biden doesn't want the conversation to be about his throwing away of 50 years of American credibility. You know, our security guarantees to our allies are all based on our credibility and that and that uh and that credibility is a precious thing but he put it all on the line in ukraine 
by drawing a line in the sand and saying, Russia, don't cross that line. And Putin went across that line with tanks. Biden and his people in the White House don't want the conversation to be about that. So they have an interest, too, in convincing us, well, he crossed the line, but the Russians aren't winning. They're doing very badly in Ukraine. They're bogged down. They're losing the war. But this encourages people to want to involve us in the war, to jump into the war. And I think that would be a grave mistake because I don't think we can trust what we're being told about the status of the war. The fog of war is very thick, especially when all of the intelligence is coming from two biased sources, the Ukrainian government and the, and the Biden White House. The last thing they want to admit is that the Russians are getting what they want in Ukraine. We are probably making a, a very serious error in assuming that the Russians are losing. It could be that what we're hearing every night on television is true. Maybe that's true. But I would remind you that it was less than a year ago that in Afghanistan, you know, we thought it was true that we could withdraw from Afghanistan, could have an Afghan government that was sympathetic to the West and that they would not immediately fall and, uh, and that we basically wouldn't have been have to withdraw in a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Taliban. Uh, our Department of Defense and our Joint Chiefs, led by, you know, the, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, this was our most important thing. The credibility of the Biden administration depended upon it, but they couldn't even defeat the Taliban. In the end, we did suffer a humiliating defeat by them. We should be mindful before we get involved in a, a war over Ukraine to remember that our nuclear deterrent is not modern the way Russia's is, that it's 30 years old. All the delivery systems were built under the Reagan administration, the nuclear weapons themselves are, are more than 30 years old. They've not been tested in 30 years. Uh, we've been patching them up and hoping that they'll work. A lot of our own nuclear weapon scientists who designed those weapons have been warning that you can't monkey around with a nuclear weapon design like that and, and have high confidence that it's gonna work. Uh, not only has Russia got modern delivery systems and modern nuclear weapons, it has super weapons that have no counterpart in the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Weapons designed to make what are called super EMP attacks. This is a, an electromagnetic field that could theoretically win a nuclear war with a single blow by frying the electronics in our forces as well as in our civilian society, the electric grids. Uh, weapons that just generate x-rays so that their anti-missile systems will work. And by the way, that's another sign of the Russian belief that they can fight and win a nuclear war. They've got 10,000 anti-ballistic and anti-aircraft missiles, 10,000 of them, and they are dual capable. They can carry conventional or nuclear weapons. You know, we have fewer than 100 uh, uh, anti-missile systems in our national missile defense, and they're not even capable of, of uh, we have grave questions about how effective they would be against the North Korean missile threat because the North Korean missiles are based on Chinese and Russian technology, which is a lot more advanced than what we thought the North Koreans would end up with. The Russians also have a unilateral advantage in biological and chemical weapons because they've cheated on both of those treaties, just as they've treated on the Tactical Nuclear Weapons Treaty, the Presidential Nuclear Initiative, and they have at least a 10 to one advantage in tactical nuclear weapons. I'm gonna to propose to you, and I'm not saying this is the ground truth in Ukraine, but I'm going to propose to you an alternative reality, something you're not going to hear from anybody else, I'm pretty sure, uh, that is not, uh, uh, you know, there's a different way of interpreting the facts on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, and it's the Austerlitz scenario. You know, we're all convinced, and uh, guys like Senator Graham want us to jump in and get involved in the war because the Ukrainians are telling us that they're killing Russians at the rate of 10 to 1, and the Russians, uh, uh, you know, are on the verge of defeat. And if we only come in and help them, that we can quickly defeat the Russians. That's what everybody thinks with 100% certainty is the truth on the ground. And I say the fog of war is so thick and the circumstances such that we can't trust that. Maybe it's true, but I don't know it's true. This could be an alternative. You know, maybe this is all being done deliberately by the Russians. And they want us to think that they're bogged down. And they want us to think that they're losing the battle because they want us to jump into the into the uh into the Ukrainian war and crush us with that 10 to one advantage in tactical nuclear weapons, the advantage in biological and chemical weapons, their advantage in cyber weapons, and just crush us and permanently solve the problem of NATO in the United States. You know, uh, you, it might be more about taking over Ukraine. Uh, it might be more than taking over Ukraine in terms of the Russian objective. Maybe what they wanna do is just 
change the world order by becoming the top dog in that world order. And how is the Battle of Austerlitz relevant to this? Well, the Russian general staff are great students of military history. Uh, Austerlitz was, their, was Napoleon's greatest victory in 1805. And uh, they make particular study of that one because the victory was over Russia itself. You know, uh, the combined armies, the greatest powers of, of, of Europe, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, the mainland Europe were involved in that battle. Uh, Russia, Austria, and Prussia were all allied together on one side against Napoleon, against the French army. And Napoleon, you know, uh, where it was fought, it was closer to Russia. So he was, uh, uh, Napoleon wanted to create the impression that he was going to lose this battle. You know, uh, he sent intelligence to the Russians and Austrians that he was overextended, that he had supply problems, that he didn't have enough men. He deliberately occupied the worst part of the battlefield. Uh, he had uh, troops defect to the Russians and Austrians to tell them, uh, oh, we're beaten. You know, we're not going to lose this war. You know, he actually had whole regiments of French troops re retreat from the Russians. All of this was to lure them into attacking and, uh, and, to, and have battle there on what had been Napoleon's chosen ground so that he could then unleash a number of corps that he could see concealed from view. And he crushed the combined forces of Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And it gave Napoleon dominance over Europe for the next decade. So these crowned heads of Europe uh, while he didn't take over their countries, they were basically bootlickers to Napoleon and had to do whatever he said until Napoleon made the fatal decision to invade Russia and uh, and stay too long. But it could be, I submit, and I'm not saying that this is the scenario that's happening. It could be that Russians are bogged down and they're losing. But I, I, but I don't think, I think we have to be more imaginative and think about, well, what are other scenarios that may be possible? Is it possible that they actually want us to intervene? It's hard to resist the conclusion that a lot of the things the Russians are doing are deliberately intended to provoke us. You know, there's it, there are a few things that are harder for the Western democracies to resist than intervening against a cruel dictator, an inhuman dictator who seems to be militarily weak. And, and, and so it will be easy to defeat him. Uh, and that seems to be an impression that Putin, maybe, maybe it's true that he is that. But it's certainly an impression he's doing nothing to discourage uh, and by, uh, by his day-to-day -day beha behavior. There's another scenario about Ukraine that we ought to keep in mind. Uh, everybody has assumed going into this, and I have to admit even myself, that if the Russians invaded Ukraine, they would want a quick victory. You know, because here I forgot about my own lesson about mirror imaging, you know, about, uh, you know, that we ought not to assume that our enemies think the way we do and would wage war the way the West would. We always want a quick victory. We want the killing and the battles to be over as possible, as soon as possible, and to capture the territory as soon as possible. And we had a reason to think that Russia might do that in Ukraine because of the way they took over Crimea. You know, they did it in lightning speed, uh, very little bloodshed, and it was a great victory for them. But there was another scenario going on right under our noses that we appear to have ignored. And that's what's happened to Luhansk and the, the, the battle, the long war, the long uh, siege war that's been going on in eastern Ukraine. That's been going on for eight years. The Russians at any time could have ended that war. They could have decisively taken over that uh, area, but they haven't. They deliberately wanted to have a protracted war in that area. Maybe what Putin wants is to, is to, uh, is to permanently have a, a, a long war going on in Ukraine as long as he can do it. Something we need to remember is that chaos uh, is in the national interests of Russia. It dries up oil prices. Their second most important industry is armaments. When the world thinks it's always on the verge of World War III, people are much more interested in buying arms. And so that's gonna help the Russian arms industry. Here's another scenario. And several of these scenarios, by the way, can be simultaneously true. Another scenario is the, the Spanish Civil War. Before Nazi Germany launched World War II, they wanted to make sure that their new weapons and tactics, the Blitzkrieg that enabled them to almost win World War II, they wanted to make sure it would work. And they wanted to have veteran soldiers who had combat experience. And so they used this, the Spanish Civil War to give combat experience to many of their soldiers and to test out their new weapons ta and tactics. Uh, I think it's no accident that Russia is using some of it, its advanced weapons, like the hypersonic ice gunner has been launched. I'm pretty sure that they didn't do that just to destroy a building. 
You know, I, I think the reason they're doing that is to test out their new weapon systems, to give experience to their troops in launching these systems, to give troop to their uh, experience to their ground troops and to their general staffs. And well, here's how you actually fight a real war. You know, a veteran soldier who's got combat experience, who's been blooded, is worth two or three soldiers who are green and who have never been exposed to combat. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things Putin wants out of this war, whether he's losing or not. He's going to value very highly the experience that his general staff and that his ground troops have gotten out of Ukraine. So these are all alternative theories to the one that is the only one that we're hearing on television every day. The one that has the happy face on it for us is that, oh, the Russians are on the verge of defeat and we can jump in there and help the Ukrainians achieve a quick victory. Please be aware, uh, you know, uh, 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 there are at least several alternative theories that suggest that if we do that, we're going to be handed on another Afghanistan, another Iraq, another Syria, another Libya, another military disaster, except this one won't be a small one. This one would be, it could destroy NATO and it could destroy the United States and it could change the balance of power in the world if we're wrong about this assessment that we're hearing every day on television. Yeah. And, uh, it's interesting you say that theory because I've heard that, and I don't know if this is true, like you say, the fog of war, but that a lot of the newer weapon systems aren't actually being used in Ukraine yet, like the newer uh, jets, like the SU, I think it's the SU-35 or is it the, the 42, uh, one of their most advanced fighter jets. Um, a lot of their air force hasn't been deployed. They're only, as of recent, using hypersonic weapons and it does appear like a lot of that is, you know, like you say, a potential testing ground for these things. So your your first theory of that you propose of them trying to bait NATO into a fight and appearing weak when they're in fact strong would make a lot of sense, you know, in light of that, uh, because, yeah, we're not seeing a lot of their more advanced weaponry that they could bring to bear being used, at least we're not seeing it. Sure. And to expand upon the points that you and I have both made, uh, the Russia only mobilized 200,000 troops to invade Ukraine. They have an army, a standing army of a million men. Uh, you know, only 75% of that 200,000 has actually gone into Ukraine. Uh, they have 2,000 aircraft in their air force, and they've only, they haven't unleashed the air force really. Uh, you know, uh, Ukraine has got 70 modern aircraft. All these air victories that they're achieving are with 70 aircraft. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Armata, their new Armata tank hasn't been sent in. Their older model tanks they've sent in to fight you. They've got 20,000 tanks, by the way. And only Russia is fighting the war in Ukraine with its fingers, not with its fists. You know, uh, it has vast conventional military potential that has not been unleashed in Ukraine. And uh, on these two things, these things too make me suspicious that what we're seeing on the ground is concocted and it's a, 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 a fiction that uh, is intended to deceive us and maybe lure us into the war. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I hope I'm wrong about that. You know, I hope the Ukrainians are really doing as well as they're telling us they're doing. But even if they are, uh, Russia is a nuclear superpower. And uh, if this thing, if we were to intervene, it's a virtual certainty it would escalate uh, and we would be the losers in, the, in that. They're postured to win a nuclear war right now. And we're very close to the edge right now, I think. The possibilities of miscalculation are extremely, even more worrisome to me than what Russian designs may be. You know, World War I started through a, a, a single bullet fired into the chest of an Austrian archduke. And through a series of miscalculations by the great powers that rapidly escalated into World War I. And in, in just a few years, there were 40 million casualties, you know, all because of miscalculation by the various sides who, by mobilizing their forces and the rest, thought the others would stand down. They didn't, nobody intended for the war to happen, but it did. Nobody intends for a nuclear war to happen or a cyber or an EMP war to happen out of this thing. Or maybe the Russians do intend it to happen. On our side, nobody wants that to happen, but the possibility of it happening through accident, through miscalculation, you know, when the superpowers confront each other is extremely high. And Ukraine, in terms of its strategic importance, is far more important than little Serbia was during World War I. You know, uh, we need to stay out of this thing. I, I, my heart goes out to the Ukrainians, but the lesson we need to draw is Ukraine is what happens 
when the United States allows its military and nuclear capabilities to become hollowed out and obsolete, the other side sees that, and then that tempts them into aggression. And we're going to see more acts of aggression unless we, the best way to avenge Ukraine is to remember the lessons of Ronald Reagan and the strategy of peace through strength. We need to make ourselves so strong again in, conven- in our economy, in our conventional weapons, and in our nuclear weapons, that no one will challenge us, that they will be afraid to go and invade Ukraine because they're, they'll be concerned about what the big dog America will do. So I wanted to ask you, you talked briefly about the super EMP weapons, and this is something which has uh, been a bit elusive for me in terms of understanding the mechanics of how that would actually work. I've heard you talk before about uh, weapons that could be deployed that are, are very similar in their effect of EMP weapons minus the the radioactive fallout and stuff like that. Could you maybe just talk a bit more about those types of uh, that type of equipment and how it might actually be used in Europe if you know push came to shove? Sure. One scenario that the EMP Commission uh, looked at, uh, you know, I was definitely involved in the analysis and it's in one of my EMP Commission reports, but we were concerned about a scenario that could happen now over the crisis in Ukraine, uh, that if Russia wanted to defeat the NATO alliance, it could do a nuclear EMP attack on NATO by detonating a nuclear weapon, a super EMP weapon at high altitude. 70 kilometers high, that's outside the atmosphere, uh, over a NATO headquarters in Brussels. And the resulting EMP field would black out electric grids from Ireland, uh, the United Kingdom, France, all the way to the, Ukraine, to the edge of Ukraine. Uh, the whole NATO alliance would be blacked out. And when you've blacked out the electric grids, all the other critical infrastructures fail too. The, there'd be no water, food would start spoiling, no telecommunications, transportation systems wouldn't work. None of the things would work that you need to mobilize your forces to defend yourselves. NATO would in effect be paralyzed by that one blow. It would be a red carpet for those 20,000 Russian tanks to reach the English Channel virtually unopposed. Uh, So that's how a a nuclear EMP uh, works or or in terms of the strategic application of a nuclear EMP attack. Uh, How does it work in terms of the physics? You know, uh, an EMP attack, an EMP is like a super energetic radio wave and it's got so much energy in it that it will uh, that it'll fry electronics, so the electronics will be destroyed across an, a, the area that the EMP field is exposing. And in this case that I just described, the EMP field would reach from from eastern Poland all the way to the uh, to, to Ireland uh, with an EMP attack like that. You could do an EMP attack over North America that would do the same thing at an altitude of 300 kilometers. The field would cover most of Canada, all 48 contiguous United States, and a good chunk of Mexico. And not only would our civilian unprotected systems be destroyed by the super EMP, but our military systems as well, because they're not hardened that high. You know, we, and during the Cold War, we only hardened them to 50,000 volts per meter, which is a very high level. I mean, imagine that 50,000 volts per meter, you know, but a super EMP weapon can make 100,000 or 200,000 volts per meter. Imagine if you had a, a, most of the things in our electronics society operate on 120 volts or less. Imagine if you had a plug in your house that could generate 100,000 volts. I mean, what do you think would happen if you plugged anything into that outlet? Obviously it would be destroyed. And so in effect, that's what you're doing when you put an EMP field down uh, over a whole continent. You know, everything that's got electronics, not everything would be destroyed necessarily. A lot of things, even most things might survive, but so much would be destroyed that it would all come grinding to a halt. You know, it doesn't take much uh, to, to stop a, an electronic civilization and to kill it. Uh, it's like the body, you know? Uh, you don't have to destroy every organ in the body to kill a person. Uh, you know, if, if you destroy enough, a few percentage, but much stuff would be destroyed, probably be much more than a few percentage than uh, by a super EMP weapon. So Automobiles do- stop, airplanes fall out of the sky, that sort of thing. Uh, so don't you think, though, that if they were to deploy such a weapon, and uh, I guess this is where I'd like to get more insight about the non-nuclear EMP weapons, because don't you think if they were to deploy such a thing that that would basically bring the the full force of uh, NATO into the war, like with the U.S. in terms of their nuclear arsenal? Like, wouldn't that prompt a nuclear response from the U.S.? Well, our nuclear weapons have to work. Uh 
you know, even the, the nuclear weapons, the electronics uh, in the delivery systems, the bombers, the ICBMs, the ballistic missile submarines, these are vastly complicated electronic machines. And uh, they're only hardened to 50,000 volts per meter. Their electronics are going to be vulnerable too. Uh, and we might not even know who attacked us. Uh, the first thing that gets taken out by an EMP are the satellites and the ballistic missile early warning radars. Uh, the EMP travels at the speed of light. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in order for us to know who attacked us, those things have to survive. And then you have to have the uh, a retaliatory capability. Um, you know, the whole point of doing an EMP would be to deny your adversary his retaliatory capability by destroying it. And I had... Uh... Dr. Arthur Bradley on here, and, and uh, we talked about your paper that you had written about uh, the potential use for an EMP weapon in Europe. And he said that one of the things that he, uh, he wasn't quite in agreement with was the, he thought that that would immediately prompt a, a nuclear response in the United States. So you don't think so. Like, obviously, on continental Europe, those oh, systems well, I... might, be, might be fried, you know, potentially the ones that aren't hardened. But what about, like, what would the U.S. response to that be? Like, would they start launching nukes at Moscow or would there be, like, some deniability there? Like, because I think he even said that they would be able to see right when the nuke went up into space. To Is that true or? Well, the, uh, the United States would be able to see when the single missile went up into space. Maybe I guess not. Either them or, they, or their, you know, uh, command and control in, in Europe would be able to see that if they launched this EMP weapon, like right when they launched it, that we would detect it. Europe doesn't have the large phased array ballistic missile early warning radars that we do, and they're not aimed over uh, the continent of Europe. What we would pick up, we might pick up if they decided to do it with an intermediate range ballistic missile. Uh, you know, uh, we might pick up the launch of that single missile, but a lot of missiles are being launched from Russia. Uh, and how would we know that missile is intended to, uh, armed with a conventional warhead? Or even if it's armed with a nuclear warhead, how do we know it's not going to go to the ground to, to attack an airbase or something like that? Uh, you know, our satellites and our, our, the North American air defense array is oriented for missiles coming over the North Pole to attack the United States, not chiefly Europe. And you can do it clandestinely. You know, you could launch a satellite and say this is a space launch vehicle. And in fact, the Russians had a secret weapon called the Fractional Orbital Bombardment System. China has it too now. By, they basically experimented with this. You could pretend that you're launching a space satellite for peaceful communications purposes, but you've got a, a, a super EMP warhead inside it. North Korea's got two satellites orbiting over North Korea as we speak, the KMS-3 and KMS-4. Uh, the day declared are peaceful satellites, but the EMP Commission has warned that these things could be armed with super EMP warheads, um, you know, and they might be orbiting us so that in an emergency, uh, North Korea could detonate them, you know, when they need to, to do an EMP attack. There's all kinds of ways of, uh, you could launch the EMP out of a, out of a uh, attack submarine, you know, uh, a cruise missile that goes to high altitude. Uh, they've got such uh, missiles. One of them, they market Internationally, it's called the Club K, and it flies at, subso at, at, uh, uh, at uh, subsonic speeds for a long period of time along close to the water. But then at the last minute, it can go up to high altitude, high enough to do an EMP attack at supersonic speeds. So they have many platforms, many different ways of doing it that don't involve ICBMs uh, that would be detectable by radar, ballistic missiles by us. And that is the, the question that your friend has, has said, and that is the usual answer, uh, that's what a lot of people have an inherent faith in, is, well, surely if Russia made a nuclear attack on, uh, on, Na on European NATO, uh, the United States is going to respond, and that's what's going to deter it. That has been the whole basis of uh, the belief of mutual assured destruction. That's what we've been gambling on. And that's why the United States needs to modernize and build up its strategic forces so that we are credible about that. Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't help deterrence when Biden, President Biden meets in Geneva with Putin and says a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. That reassures the Russians and Chinese and North Koreans that that's what we believe. OK, uh, but they need to be convinced that we are willing to use nuclear weapons to come to the defense of our friends. That's a huge assumption. 
Would the United States put itself at risk, uh, you know, to save NATO Europe? That's the promise. That's what everybody assumes. But when it really comes down to it, do the Russians really believe that we would do that? I don't think they're impressed with our behavior in Ukraine. I mean, maybe that's why Lindsey Graham uh, and others want us to go in, uh, you know. Uh, right now, American policy in Ukraine is to fight to the death of the last brave Ukrainian and apply economic sanctions against Russia as if that's really doing something. How many times have we applied economic sanctions and they've done nothing? We've done it against Iran, against North Korea, against China. They're, they're, uh, economic sanctions don't seem to accomplish anything. When the economic sanctions really work, they can actually provoke a war. That's why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor because FDR wanted them to stop attacking China. And so he employs the, uh, an oil sanction on, on Japan. And they had to make a choice. Do we surrender to the economic sanctions from the degenerate Americans who are not willing to, to, to fight us? Or do we launch Pearl Harbor and take over, establish our Southeast Asia co-prosperity co sphere, invading the Philippines, invading Southeast Asia, and achieve our dream uh, of, a, of a, a Japanese Pacific Empire. They chose most military dictatorships only in respect military strength. And that's what the Japanese did. So, uh, you know, we're not, what we're doing here in Ukraine uh, isn't building up our credibility that we're willing to uh, take existential risks in order to save our friends. Yeah, you know, you bring up such a great point that I don't think a lot of, and it goes back to that fundamental belief about mutually assured destruction is we take for granted this notion that, you know, we're suddenly going to jump in and just because Russia uses a nuke over there, that we're suddenly going to uh, jump in and be the saviors and put our own existence at risk. But, uh, you know, perhaps our, our military generals, you know, aren't going to play that game and maybe Russia knows it and they're going to call the bluff, as you say. Exactly. So, I think they're calling the bluff now. Uh, and uh, that's why they invaded Ukraine, because they don't believe it anymore. Uh, they don't believe that we are credible when it comes to our nuclear security guarantees. Why should they? When we have allowed our nuclear triad to become obsolete and when uh, we have nuclear weapons that are have been untested in 30 years, Congress accepts every year, the national laboratories every year uh, they get certify the nuclear weapons still work, even though we haven't tested them. And even though we're patching them together, but do, do the Russians and Chinese believe that? They've been testing their nuclear weapons. Uh, the State Department at, uh, admitted last year that they've been violating the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty for 30 years, and they've been doing low yield tests of their nuclear weapons. So they can have confidence their nuclear inventory is going to work. Everything out of our mouths and everything we do would lead our adversaries to think that we don't take nuclear deterrence seriously anymore. And I think they're calling our bluff right now. I'm almost reluctant to say this because this is a Canadian audience, all right? Uh, you they're, know, but they're mostly you, actually an American audience, believe it or not. Okay. But as an advocate of national interest, you know, of America first and a, na a national interest, you know, uh, if I were advising a president and Russia started a nuclear war in NATO, you know, uh, I'd say uh, I don't think I would advise the president to put America at risk to save the NATO member states who, who have basically not done their job to maintain their militaries at a sufficient level of strength to deter the Russians. You know, that's been a long complaint for, from, from us. I mean, they have allowed their military strength to so deteriorate that they've become tempting. I mean, I think one of the other reasons Russia has been willing to invade Ukraine is that they know NATO is militarily hollow. I mean, do you know that, uh, I mean, there was a time during the Cold War when Russia, when Germany, you know, had uh, uh, a couple of thousand main battle tanks. Germany has 250 main battle tanks today. But we had 5,000 main battle tanks in Germany during the Cold War. Uh, Obama took them all out. There were zero main battle tanks, U.S. main battle tanks in Europe under Obama. Trump started putting some back in, but we only have 100 main battle tanks in Germany today. You know, one of the reasons the Ukrainians are doing so well is the Ukraine has as many main battle tanks uh, as the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and the Benelux countries combined. You know, that's one of the reasons they may be doing so well against the, the, the Russians, because they've got many more ba main battle tanks than European NATO has. 
the other part of the equation, going back to the scenarios, you know, if Ukraine is achieving vic uh, victory over the Russians, and that happens to be true, does that, uh, even if it's true, does that mean it should jump into it? Let's not forget, by the Russians fighting the Ukrainian army, they're in effect fighting the Russian army. The Ukrainian general staff and their troops were trained by the Russians. They're using Russian military equipment. The Ukrainians know how the Russian general staff thinks. That may be another reason why, if they're doing well, they're, they're, doing, they're doing well. Uh, why would we assume that, uh, that we would find the same fortune, assuming the Ukrainians are meeting with good fortune? We haven't tested our stuff against, the, uh, against Russian plans, Russian equipment, the Russian way of warfare. Uh, you know, we might be very surprised to discover that our hollowed out militaries, the European NATO, don't do well on the Ukrainian battlefield. We, and we can't even do it, by the way. Uh, you know, NATO has never exercised projecting large numbers of general purpose forces into Eastern Europe. The defense of Western European NATO at the height of the Cold War was always defensive. The Russians were supposed to attack and we were supposed to hold them off. And we thought we would have to resort to tactical nuclear weapons in order to hold them off. You know, this idea that we're going to project power into Eastern Europe and defeat the Russians sounds very Napoleonic to me. I don't mean 18, 1805 Napoleonic. I mean 1812 Napoleonic, when he when he led the French army, the Grand Army, into Russia, and it ended up getting destroyed by General Winter and by the uh, by the Russian army. But to go back to your to, to your friend, I mean, uh, uh, it's all again. It all depends on credibility. And, you know, he speaks with such great certainty that yes, the United States would do that. Uh, I don't know that that's clear at all. We hope, or at least our European allies hope the United States would do that. Japan hopes that we will come to their rescue. Uh, you know, uh, our, uh, our other partners in the, in, in the Pacific hopes that we would use our nuclear weapons to defend them, to deter the nuclear umbrella. But the nuclear umbrella is old and tattered and tired. And even our, uh, and at least this current political leadership seems to believe in it so little that he would that that in Geneva last summer he said a nuclear war cannot be fought cannot be won and should never be fought forgetting that the United States has won a nuclear war you know we won World War II that was a nuclear war the Russians know that you can certainly win a nuclear war against any country that doesn't have nuclear weapons and that's most of the world you know but we seem to have forgotten that lesson uh, the assumption that a nuclear war can't be won is based all on this hope or this pre premise that the United States will be there for our allies and be willing to put our own homeland at risk, uh, even if they attack Latvia, you know, with a nuclear weapon. Most Americans can't even find Latvia on a map. Someone once said, never promise to go to nuclear war for a country you can't find on a map. You know, uh, we could have a whole other conversation about whether we should have expanded NATO in the first place. I don't think we should have because it created this very situation. Uh, when I was young, when I was a young man, I was on the House Armed Services Committee and I had the NATO portfolio. And one of my jobs was to go to these East European countries that were former Warsaw Pact countries and come back and advise Congress on whether we should expand NATO to the East or not. And I said, we shouldn't. You know, these countries are really not capable of defending themselves. Their economies are weak. They're going to be dependent. Uh, we, we can't defend them. We can't project power. The only way we can defend them is with our, our nuclear deterrent. So we are going to basically be making a prom giving a promissory note to countries like Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, uh, Slovakia, you know, the Czech Republic, all these former Warsaw Pact member states, a promissory note that we're going to go to nuclear war to defend their sovereignty. As a footnote to the Ukraine war, by the way, the whole, one of the main reasons Russia has invaded Ukraine is because it believed that Ukraine was going to become a member of NATO. And that even if we didn't officially make Ukraine a member of NATO, that it had in effect was becoming a de facto member of NATO. Aren't we behaving exactly as if that's true? And uh, isn't our behavior and, and this warmongering that's going on playing right in to the paranoid views of the Russian general staff and a lot of the Russian people that, look, it, Putin was right. We were planning to make U Ukraine a member of NATO and we're behaving just as if they're really a member of NATO. You know, my heart bleeds for the Ukrainians, but, uh, you know, uh, but our own, the survival of our own nations come first. You know, the lesson we need to draw from this is that we can't afford to be militarily weak anymore. We've got to rebuild our strength.
Had we, had we maintained that military strength and pursued the peace through strength strategy, maybe Russia would have remained contained and, uh, and, and Ukraine not become a victim. And I, I have this fascinating stuff. I could listen to you talk about this stuff all day, but I just have a couple specific questions. Um, one is with respect to the ICBMs and the submarines. I had a couple commenters on a recent video say that there is ICBMs on the submarines. I just want to know if you can maybe comment a bit about that. Could you just explain in more detail what the capabilities of the submarines is? Because for everybody, for most people, that's the the big one of the triad, and that's yes. our primary tools in the arsenal. Now, if you're saying that that is uh, limited in its capability, and maybe you could talk about how many submarines are on patrol at any given time, uh, to the best of your ability, of course. Uh, the Ohio-class submarines that we have now, that were built during the Reagan administration, are armed with the Trident missile. This is a sub-launched ballistic missile. It's not an intercontinental ballistic missile. It's an intermediate-range ballistic missile. The Trident can't reach Russia from its port. It can't launch from port, and we don't even have command and control arrangements uh, at our port facilities to launch those missiles because they don't have the range. They have to go to the mid-Atlantic or mid-Pacific uh, to their patrol areas to be able to reach Russia. Most of our submarines are not at sea. Uh, you know, it used to be during the height of the Cold War that about half of them would be at port and then about half of them at sea. But because the Trident has become so aged, we've reduced the operational tempo of the Trident ballistic missile submarines so that only about a third of them are at sea at any time. We have a fleet of about 14 Trident uh, Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. Most of them are at port. Uh, you know, we only have about four of them at sea at any time, two in the Atlantic and two in the Pacific. Uh, so they're basically, so the, all those submarines are sitting ducks. The ballistic missile submarines at port would be destroyed in a surprise attack. Our ballistic, our strategic bombers that take three days to mobilize would be destroyed in a surprise attack. If they could beat us to the draw, they can destroy our ICBMs in their silos. One of the purposes of an EMP attack would be to paralyze our command and control system so that we would not be able to rapidly launch our silo-based ICBMs. And that would give the Russians the opportunity, the capability to destroy those, those ICBMs, the Minuteman, in their silos. And it would also get a system kill of our ballistic missile submarines that are on patrol at sea. Because our ballistic missile submarines do not carry unlocking codes. They have to get an emergency action message from the president, which includes unlocking codes, so that we could then unlock the weapons and the missiles so they could be fired. If you fail to get uh, the uh, emergency action message, the submarines are useless. And uh, that is another reason for doing the EMP attack because it will destroy the, the command and control arrangements that are necessary to, to, uh, to uh, utilize the submarines on patrol at sea. This is not the case with the Russians. And I was trying to contrast this in my earlier talk because the Russians do have ICBMs on their, on their submarines. They have arranged to reach the United States right from port. This is because they're such big believers in surprise attack. If we launch a surprise attack, not only can they launch their ICBMs, that they're going to launch those ICBMs at port. And if they, they want to launch a surprise attack, they can do it with their ICBMs, with their ballistic missile submarines at port, and with the ballistic missile submarines at sea, because they have these undersea cables where they can hook in to get emergency action messages secretly. So that's a huge difference between our strategic posture and theirs. As I said at the beginning, our strategic posture and the Russian strategic posture is as different as night and day. Ours, our strategic forces are designed for transparency and for deterrence and what's called crisis stability, you know, so that the other side doesn't start getting suspicious that we're going to make a surprise attack against them in the middle of a crisis like the Ukraine war. The Russian strategic posture is designed for fighting a war, for winning a war, and to do so by achieving a surprise attack. That's why they have put most of their eggs, almost all their nuclear weapons, on intercontinental ballistic missiles, both in silos, mobile ICBMs, and their sea-based deterrent, things that can be launched in a few minutes with very little warning. And what about aircraft carriers? Do they have any capability to uh, project nuclear? They used to. Uh, we used to have tactical nuclear weapons on our aircraft carriers and our, on our attack submarines. Uh, uh, not the ballistic missile submarines, but the attack submarines. They would have slickums on them, sub-launch cruise missiles that would have tactical nuclear warheads. But we took all of that away during the Cold War. 
In fact, the United States unilaterally dismantled uh, under the presidential nuclear initiative, uh, President Bush, the first President Bush, ar arrived in agreement with President Yeltsin, uh, you know, that we were going to get rid of tactical nuclear weapons. Both sides were supposed to dismantle their tactical nuclear weapons. And this was during the last year of the Bush administration. And we did. We got rid of almost all of our tactical nuclear weapons, including those that were deployed on aircraft carriers and submarines. Uh, today, we only have about 180 tactical nuclear weapons left. We, we stopped dismantling them when the State Department finally admitted that the Russians were cheating on the presidential nuclear initiative. They did not follow our example. Uh, and uh, they did dismantle about 75% of their tactical nuclear weapons, maybe. You know, we can't independently verify that. Right. Uh, but they themselves have said that they've dismantled 75%. But that still leaves them potentially with at least 2,000. We know they have at least 2,000 tactical nuclear weapons versus fewer than 200 for us. And they may have as many as 8,000 tactical nuclear weapons. And all, uh, most of their tactical nuclear weapons are new generation nuclear weapons designed to produce no radioactive fallout, designed for very low yields uh, or, 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 or selectable yields. So you could do anything from blowing up a bridge to blasting a whole you know, division of tanks with that, same, uh, with that same weapon for special effects like EMP effects on the battlefield, EMP effects for anti-aircraft purposes, X-rays for anti-missile purposes. We don't have anything like that in our inventory. Uh, uh, they, uh, they even probably have air-to-air -air nuclear missiles you know, to compensate for our advantage, our technological advantages in our, in our aircraft, uh, nuclear artillery. You know, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if their tanks have got uh, nuclear rounds in them so that they can win a tank battle. One tank could win a tank battle, perhaps against a whole company of, uh, of, our, of our best tanks. They are prepared to fight and win a nuclear war at every level, you know, on the battlefield, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, or strategically between the homelands. Uh, and maybe just in closing, because I know you you have to go, but uh, what do you think is the likelihood of like the true likelihood of something like this uh, occurring? I know the U.S. right now at least is looking at upgrading their their nuclear defense system. I heard a figure of like six hundred and thirty four billion dollars over the next 10 years. And I don't know how uh, if that's credible or if that's something which has been passed yet in Congress. But is what do you think the likelihood is where we're at now with what's going on in Eastern Europe of an actual, like if you were to put it at like a percentage, you know, of, of nuclear uh, weapons being used, and I know it's totally arbitrary, but, uh, you know, just to give our, our viewers a sense of, because we're all about preparedness here and trying to prepare for these events. And I live in Saskatchewan, which is right above the, you know, North Dakota, Montana, that whole, uh, place where they got the ICBMs. So, you know, a lot of people want to know, like, what is the real threat of this at this point in time? Well, we are investing. Uh, that pro that's not an unrealistic figure. But what it's going to buy us uh, is new submarines, new ICBMs, and new bombers in the 2030s. Okay? We're 10 years away from getting any of those systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really far behind, and it's not going to get us new weapons. We're still going to be stuck with the same old weapons. Uh, you know, we need to do a lot more than that. And I know it's going to be a big bill, but if we were keeping pace with the Russians and the Chinese all along, it wouldn't be such a big bill. You know, we've been on a nuclear deterrence holiday for 30 years. So what can one expect at the end of the day? It's obviously going to be a big bill to catch up. That's why I recommended I don't even know if we can catch up. We're so far behind in the technologies and the modernity of the systems. That's why I think we need to give a real high priority to strategic defensive systems, hardening our grids, hardening uh, against both cyber and EMP, and deploying space-based missile defenses so that we can technologically leapfrog past this and change the nature of the competition. You know, what is the likelihood of this happening? You know, such things are always impossible to answer. You know, I mean, it would just be a guess. Uh, we are certainly at a, an elevated risk. I think the danger of a nuclear conflict, uh, both law, whether it starts in, uh, and the escalatory possibilities, I think our situation today is more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have never before put ourselves in a situation where the adversary has declared the mobilization of his forces and is postured for surprise attack while we just do nothing. You know, Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis 
raised the DEFCON level of our, of our nuclear deterrent almost, as almost as high as he could without actually getting in a nuclear war. He actually went to DEFCON 2, which is just short of actually getting in a nuclear war. And as a consequence, he was able to de-escalate the Cuban Missile Crisis and, 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 and prevail in that crisis. This is the first time we've ever faced you know, a real possibility of a surprise nuclear attack, but we've left our forces at DEFCON 5. You know? uh, uh, and I think he, Biden has done that for political reasons, because he doesn't want to admit that we're in a nuclear crisis. But it leaves our forces vulnerable. The submarines are not at sea. The bombers are not being mobilized. The ICBMs are their normal everyday readiness. Uh, the command and crucial command and control assets, which are particularly the Takamo aircraft, all of them are Tinker Air Force Base, almost all of them, except for two. On a normal situation, we keep one on the, on the Atlantic coast and one on the Pacific coast. But all of them, almost all of them are just sitting ducks, sitting there at Tinker. They should have been dispersed, but they haven't been. So the opportunity for our adversary is very good if he wanted to do it now. And the geostrategic situation that we are facing right now for years and years, everyone has agreed, uh, you know, that a scenario that is most likely to result in a nuclear war is exactly the one we're looking at now, where the two superpowers became engaged in a big war in Europe. And that's what's happened. Uh, you know, that's your most important indicator. Uh, so, you know, I think I can't put a percentage on it, uh, uh, you know, but even a small increase and the possibility of an existential threat should be unacceptable to us, you know, because the consequences are, are, are doom, you know? Uh, and I think there's been at least an increase by a small percentage. I think it's personally, I think it's much bigger than that. I think we're very close to the edge and let's hope that the critics are not, are, are not right. That Putin has gone crazy, that he's uh, facing an internal revolt by his own elites. People are sort of celebrating that and cheering that on. Uh, I can't think of an even more dangerous situation than a major war in Europe where the two superpowers are involved and one side is crazy. I mean, uh, <clears throat> that's not, uh, uh, you can't put a happy face on that scenario when it comes to the prospect of nuclear war. Yeah. And uh, I just want to conclude in saying that, you know, I've had a lot of people comment on the channel about how, well, you know, we have secret weapons and, you know, this exceptionalist view that I think for a lot of people is uh, something, an idea they hold on to, to comfort themselves, to, that we, yes. you know, we might not be sharing our plans, but, you know, we have a plan, don't worry, you know, but to me, you know, that's a very convenient uh, thing for us to believe, but, you know, what if denial it's not? Denial behavior. <laughs> Psychiatrists call it denial behavior. You know, people who don't want, don't want to face up to reality we're a very open society. It's very hard for us to keep secrets. You know, I, I wish it were true, you know, that we had secret weapons that were stored away, uh, you know, and all of this uh, and our vulnerability is not a fact. I had described Russian strategic culture as one of dysfunctional uh, of paranoia. Okay. Our strategic culture, I describe as dysfunctional optimism, you know, and that's an exactly the kind of thing that you get from our strategic culture. We don't, we, we don't want to face up to the hard, scary facts. We would prefer to see the bright side. If there's any way of, of seeing a bright side, we, we look at that side. Oh, the Russians are being beaten in Ukraine. They're, they're winning. That's got to be the reality. It can't be that there's some other alternative theory that isn't, that isn't as positive for our side. Uh, and if there isn't a, a positive reality for us to, uh, or a positive possibility for us to look to, then we invent things. We'll actually invent uh, scenarios that, that don't even exist. Like, oh, well, we've got a secret weapon that's gonna change everything. And, uh, and so we don't have to worry about that. I can go back to living the good life and having a good time and sleep well at night, you know? And, uh, and this has gotten us into trouble in all of our wars too. Every one of these defeats that we've had since the end of World War II, including the beginning of World War II itself, has come out of a strategic culture of dysfunctional optimism, where we think, you know, if all, all conflicts can be negotiated away, and if they can't be negotiated away, you know, then we can get in there and uh, and uh, and our military primacy is always going to win. And uh, and and we can reconstruct the victim society, the the, the other side, share uh, along our own image and uh, to share our values. And I don't know how many times we have to have have to lose a war, you know, to learn the lesson. We never seem to to, to learn, and maybe it's impossible for us to learn. 
Maybe it's our hubris, you know, because it's the nature of our strategic culture, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, rooted in this. But that's why we have specialists and experts who are supposed to worry about these things for us. Um, alas, we don't listen to them. There have been people telling us and warning us, the bomb designers, the missile designers, the Department of Defense has been warning for many years, you know, the deterrent is getting old. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, almost, uh, it's almost at the point where it has no credibility at all anymore. And people have been ignoring them. Uh, in fact, in fact, the administration, this is the dysfunctional optimism is to the point of fantasy now, you know, because the people, who, the anti-nuclear activists who are, who, who are not a fringe group anymore, they, they are in the Biden administration. The Biden administration, an important part of their political base are anti-nuclear activists. They have a, there are important positions in the Biden administration uh, that anti-nuclear activists have been appointed to. There are leading members of Congress in very important positions, like Adam Smith, who's in effect an anti-nuclear activist. He's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. After President Biden, he's the second most important Ameri man in America to, to decide whether we're going to modernize our nuclear deterrent and our conventional forces, because he controls the defense budget. And Adam Smith has been for banning our ICBMs, getting rid of our strategic bombers, and cutting the ballistic missile submarine fleet in half because we don't need, because he believes in minimum deterrence and mutual assured destruction and nuclear weapons are unusable and you can't win a nuclear war. So all we need is the bare minimum and we'll be okay. And these people haven't given up on that. Even in, in the situation that we're going through now, there are, the Biden administration has been holding off on the nuclear posture review, which could make all of this come true. All of these bad things could come true on Biden's a, a nuclear posture review. They haven't changed their minds, despite the fact of this uh, uh, being on the on the edge of a nuclear conflict with Russia over Ukraine. So this this is an ex another example of denial behavior and what a strategic culture of dysfunctional optimists will do. Yeah, I agree, and it, it would appear to me that if you had something like that, you would want to put it out there that you had it as a deterrence, you know, because that would be in line with our deterrence strategy thus far. Yeah, what's the point of it if you don't have it? Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, anyways, it's been great having you on today, and I appreciate you uh, coming on sharing your expertise. I hope that uh, you would come back and join us again. I'm going to, you know, we're going to put this out there for the community, and if they have questions, we will uh, compile some more questions for you. And as this whole thing progresses, I'm sure, you know, your insights are, are bound to change and evolve as well. So thanks a lot for coming out. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I look forward to returning. Awesome. Thank you again. Okay. You take care. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com, where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk and no gimmicks. Use discount code PREPPINGGEAR for 10% off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.